All right, brilliant. So hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Alfonso, and I'm a software consulting engineer at Cisco Systems. And today, I want to extend an invitation to all of you, all of you who are data network admins, all of you who are fellow coders, and everybody in between, to explore together the world of network programmability and also to see how we can achieve vendor neutrality in our different environments using the OpenConfig initiative. At the end of the session, I hope that you can take home with you some nice tips and tricks of the model-based network programmability and also how to leverage OpenConfig in your different day-to-day uh, -day endeavors, right? So a little bit of me. Uh, I'm a software consulting engineer of the software and automation team in uh, Cisco Systems Portugal. This is a photo that I love to share. It's at the Tokyo offices. We have a mascot per technology. That's pretty cool. And here I'm leaving my uh, GitHub user and also my LinkedIn just in case you want to keep up with the conversation afterwards. I will be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have after the session. But before we formally begin, I want to share with you a horror story, which unfortunately I'm pretty certain that will ring the bell with some of you. So let's go back in time to when COVID hit and we had to redefine uh, the way we worked, the way our customers were operating, at least at Cisco. And I remember back in the days, one of my main customers was a bank, one of the biggest banks in the country. And you know that banks, they have branches, and what they needed to do is that they needed to upscale or downscale their physical branches or physical network based on how the COVID situation would be unfolding. That means shutting down some parts of the network, putting them on standby and just changing things here and there, right? That's a relatively simple task in, in the sense of, hey, this is like some access control lists. This is some interfaces in the network. But if we multiply that for a couple of thousand devices, a couple of thousand instances in the network, that gets very complicated. And a network is a living creature. It has different devices that do different things. It has different vendors as well. And it's really hard to keep up when we do things manually or like in a very classical way. You see, we, uh, my team was uh, commanded to do that. It was commanded to do this sort of operations. And very quickly, we realized that the CLI, you know, connecting via SSH to these devices was not going to do it anymore. Because although these are very simple commands, all this, the good old copy and paste, copy and paste would bring us a lot of trouble. And this typical scenario is like, hey, where is the list of devices that we're going to work with today? Oh, somebody has that spreadsheet somewhere there. Which are the commands that we have to put in there? Oh, I have it here in my notepad. Let me send, it, send that to you. We spent more time troubleshooting mistakes than actually doing the fixes. And of course, we had the pressure of the time on us because this was an unfolding situation. It was, again, when COVID was starting to get real, really messy, really fast. So what do we do? Well, and, and just here, this couple of things, what tends to go wrong, as I mentioned before, these error-prone massive configurations, this copy and paste doesn't scale up pretty well in the networking world. But this is the way we do things in the networking world. It's not, it doesn't evolve as fast as other uh, sort of things in the, in the IT world, right? So what did we do? Of course, we built a script. It was just a quick workaround. We used some uh, libraries that uh, helped us to emulate this input of CLI commands. It was like some sort of like a middleman in between us and the network devices. What happened there? It was just mimicking that CLI input, like, hey, just get into this interface, put this and this and this and that, commit, that's it. Let's go to the next device and the next one and the next one and the next one. What happens when we get this sort of approach? Well, we don't have uh, error control. We don't have commit control. We don't have any sorts of validations. It's just a matter of pure luck, fingers crossed, that this is going to fly, right? And a couple of side effects about this that we re we're really not expecting is that these commands, these scripts, they wouldn't work on different versions of the same vendor. And also, when we migrated these uh, devices, some commands changed 
right? And our script wasn't keeping up with that. That means that our script for some other tasks was just useless. It was worth nothing. And here it's important to remind ourselves that the CLI, when we log in via SSH to a device, this CLI is intended for humans and humans only. It is not an API. It is not intended for machines or automation. We were not the only ones with this concern. And later on, uh, when I moved into this team, I saw that there is a completely different approach to this sort of network automation. And it is entirely based on models. A model is something that I can track, is something that I can do version control, is something that I can have on my Git, and that I can do a precise standardized uh, uh, checkup for the automation of my networks. And furthermore, what we will check here is, imagine if we could talk to our devices using the exact same model, regardless of the vendor. It could be a Cisco, it could be a Huawei, it could be a Nokia. What if I could talk to all of them the same way? So that's what we're gonna uh, uh, talk about today. This is a briefing of the agenda. We'll have a look at a one-on-one of model-driven programmability, then open config or one model to rule them all. Then the nukes and crannies about this initiative, and finally some tips and tricks. We'll talk about this one on one, as I mentioned, and also I'm going to brief you into the Yang modeling language for uh, uh, those of you who are not familiar with it already. And we'll have an overview of the Open Config initiative. We won't dig deeper into detail regarding data networks like routing protocols, whatever that may be or vendor specifics regardless, uh, regarding the, the networking vendors out there, right? So let's dig into uh, model-driven programmability. I love to share this picture of a t-shirt that is in my, the office of my business unit in Stockholm. It's the foundation values, so to say, of programmability. And well, this new, well, not that new, it's been in the industry for quite a while, but this approach towards uh, network programmability consists on using models for everything. These models are standardized. They follow uh, RFCs, which are well-written, well-reviewed, and these are inbuilt mechanisms for operating with my devices. Right? It could be a Cisco, Nokia, a Huawei. Each of these devices will define itself in a model, and I will be able to use that model in different ways to interact with my devices. But what is this model? What's a model, actually? First of all, we need to understand how can we write these models. And for that, we're going to use the Yang modeling language. This is just a modeling language. as any other, it's just for representing data. It is not a programming language. It will just help us to define data structures in the most consistent, most standardized way possible. As you can see here, it is a, a based, well, the, the latest version is based on an RFC, and it helps us to define a couple of things, to model a couple of things. For example, we can model the specifics of my device. How does the interfaces on my Juniper look like? Which features do they have? How does an ACL, an access control list, look like? Which are the parameters? An ACL has a name, it has a type, it has an IP address, whatever that is, right? We can define devices, we can define services as well. For example, if I want to set up a BGP protocol, which are the components of my BGP protocol? I can define those on a Yang uh, model. And of course, we have different types. It can be industry standard, mostly defined by the IETF, or defined by my specific vendor. I have my bill and definition for my Cisco XR. I have my interfaces for my Juniper, and so on, and so on. As simple as that. How are we actually going to write these models? This is just a couple of references. These are the most um, widely used structures that we can find in a .yang file. We start with the most atomic unit, which is a leaf. A leaf is just one type of data, very simple unit like that. For example, here a host name, it's a leaf, and it's type a string, right? Then we have a lift list, which is pretty straightforward. A lift list is a 
a collection of leaves, right? For example, I can have a list of DNS servers. We can only have one type, so this is a type string. So that is DNS server one, DNS server two, and so on, and so on, and so on. You can see the syntax here. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, highlight it. It feels a little bit, you know, like a JSON-ish style. It kind of keeps the vibes, but uh, it has like some very specifics. We have to uh, define things, you know, with a semicolon, and you know, it will make a, a lot more sense when we have a look at an example, right? I would just uh, like you to get a glimpse on the structures here. Moving on, we have a list, a list data type. This is a collection of leaves. This can be uh, different types, but uh, same as a dictionary in your favorite programming language, it is organized in a key value fashion. So for example, here we have uh, an interface. An interface uh, has, for example, a name and an MTU. And the, the key is going to be the name because it cannot be duplicated. The, the names of my interfaces in my Arista box they have to be unique, right? And uh, last but not least, we have the containers. Containers are nothing but a logical grouping of all these different entities. They help us to make sense out of uh, all these different components. And uh, we can have different kinds of leaves, different kinds of elements in there. For example, this one, it's a definition of a system, whatever system, right? Could be a server, whatever that may be. So the systems, they will have a host name and a time zone. And we can have like a system here, another system somewhere else. It's just like a grouping of sorts, right? Now, we know how to write our models using the Yang language. How are we going to be using these models to communicate with our devices? We have different protocols. We have different standardized, like, battle scarred protocols, uh, may I say. I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, the two which are the most widely used. The first one is NetConf. This one, it's like our work, um, yeah, our workhorse. This one is really like battle scarred, bulletproof. This is the one that you will find most likely in the industry. It's based on RFCs and we are enabled to do different operations with our devices with very tight control. We can do uh, commits of things, we can do partial commits, we can do uh, retrieve configurations, we can edit changes, um, and it's entirely based on RPCs or remote uh, procedure calls. The payload of these calls, it's going to be made up of XML format and it will follow the structure of our Yang data models. We'll see that in a moment. And very important, NetConf is based on SSH. So that means that we first need to have an SSH session established with my devices, and then I can start talking NetConf. How does this go? How does this waltz go? This is a very like simplified version of it, but it's just for you to have the idea. First of all, I create my SSH session with, I don't know, my Nokia box. Perfect, that's it. Now I have this SSH session. Then uh, this box is going to send me a hello message. I have here a very small example. This hello message will contain all the capabilities. That means all the things that my Nokia box can do, which means all the models that are built in my device. Then once I get all these capabilities, I can start doing operations with my device. And for that, I'm going to be sending RPC calls. You can see a couple of things here. I have my message, which is completely XML format. I have the, the operation that I want to do. In this case, it's a edit configuration. Where am I going to edit this configuration? It's in the running database. Something that I didn't put here is that NetConf has three different databases. We have startup database, running database, and candidate database. I'm not gonna go into uh, de um, deeper detail now, but here we're targeting the running configurations database. I'm going to create an SNMP trap. For that, you can see the payload in the middle. It's based on a Yang data model. Transformed into XML, yes, but it has the exact same features, the exact same tags in there that I would find in my Yang data model. 
And that would be pretty much it. This is sent. We can have a commit, and that's how my configurations are going to take place in my, I don't know, Arista device, whatever that may be. We have another protocol, which is the RESTConf one. It works in a pretty similar way. However, it's, entire, it's based on an entirely different transport protocol. Here we are talking about HTTPS. And it works uh, as pretty much any other REST uh, API. We have the same set of verbs, get, post, put, patch, whatever that is. And here the difference is that, yes, I'm going to be operating using a URL. You can see it there down below the curl. And uh, that's how I'm going to be communicating with my device. Also, the payload is going to be based on a Yang model. And uh, I can use either XML or JSON, depends on, depending on what my requirements are, right? But this is pretty much how it works, uh, NetConf and RESTConf. And now let's have a look at a live demo. Let me show you here. Uh, I have prepared this uh, Juniper uh, notebook. And in this case, uh, let's say that I want to create um, an ACL, right? An access control list. If I do this using CLI, this is a fairly complex one, right? Like here I have a lot of commands. I would need to log into my CLI, start creating my access list, putting all the different commands and just start there, just you know, typing, 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 or copying and pasting. Uh, just out of curiosity, this ACL, it's enabling some traffic on this subnet. It's en enabling this specific quality of service tag. A couple of things, right? So now let's say that I want to do the exact same thing, but using uh, models and using uh, netconf. For that, let's do it on Python. We can do it with any other given programming language, but in this case, I'm going to be using Python. We have a library called NCC Client. It allows us to use netconf from, well, our Python um, environment, right? From our Python script. So here, I'm going to create this, uh, establish a connection. This is an SSH connection, which I will later leverage on netconf. This is, by the way, happening live. Um, a friend of mine says, uh, I live uh, with the demo or I die by demo. So, well, <laughs> this demo is fortunately working. Uh, I'm using a live uh, router uh, available in our sandboxes at Cisco. You can also use it as well. I'll tell you later how to, how to use that. So now, what I'm going to do is send that hello message. You remember when we established the, the connection. And what I'm going to get is this huge list of all the different data models inside of my iOS XR router. You can see here that I have a lot of models for different things, right? Here I have some for telemetry. I have here some for, let's see, uh, TACAX, whatever that might be, right? Now I have all these models, but I only want one. I only want the model for my access control lists. This is the one that I want to use. So I'm going to get it, I'm going to filter it, and I'm going to write it on a file here in my laptop. And now I'm going to show it. You can see here that we have these structures in the Yang modeling language. This is the exact same thing that I could do on CLI, but now it is here described in Yang. I have a prefix, it's a list. I can have one or many different prefixes. Here I have, uh, for example, the name, what would be the name, prefix list, list entry. It is a sequence number, right? Grant, which is allow traffic or reject the traffic. I have the net mess, um, yeah, here the softnet pa uh, part of my ACL, whatever that may be, right? Reading it like this can be a little bit cumbersome, especially if I want to do documentation. Maybe I'm working on uh, a project and I want to have this on a repo. We can make, we can use a uh, Python tool, which is called PyYang. PyYang will allow us to render this on a tree, which is easier to read and well, to better understand the structure of these models. So what I'm going to do here is that I will download some other dependencies. These are some other Yang files, which have, for example, the data types. These are like some dependencies, right? I'm going to download them, write them and have them here in files in my computer, and then I will execute PyYang, which is here. And you can see here 
that I have this tree structure. I have, okay, these are my ACLs, right, for IPv4. I can have one or many, this is a list, and when one of these uh, access list entries, they have a sequence number. They, are, they grant or reject traffic, they have protocol type, source network, they have all these different parameters, right? Just for you to, to know what's going on, if we have a question mark, that means that this parameter is optional. If it's an asterisk, that means that it's a list, a leaf list, you remember. And if it's an um, exclamation mark, that means that it's a choice, that we have a, like, a sort of enumeration in there. So with this, it's easier to read and to track all those different structures, right, in the tree. So now let's go back to our presentation. There's another tool that we can use. We'll di uh, dive into those details later. All right. Now, I want to ask all of you, any Tolkien fans in the room, Lord of the Ring files, if you could raise your hand, I want to spot all of you. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm also a huge fan of the work of Master Tolkien. And thinking about references to open config, it was pretty natural to come across this, to put this together, which I'm going to read out loud now for you. One model to rule them all, one model to find them, one model to bring them all, and not in the darkness, but in the network, bind them. I couldn't put in much more simpler words the mission of the Open Config <laughs> Initiative. This initiative, it's a joint effort of different uh, service providers and the networking vendors to establish a common ground in what comes to the models that we use to operate our devices. That means that instead of having this specific Yang that I just downloaded for the access control lists of my Cisco iOS XR router, I'm going to have one for ACLs for everybody. It could be a Cisco, it could be a Nokia, it could be a Juniper, an Arista. This is the mission of the Open Config Initiative. It goes a little bit beyond that. We, it also tries to set up things for management protocols, streaming telemetry, to have as much common ground as possible. But now we're going to be focusing mostly on the models part of this initiative. Some, in a nutshell, this is what we get. We, have, we are entirely based on Yang, which as I mentioned before, it follows the IETF standards, so that means that it's going to be as standardized as possible. It's going to be vendor neutral by nature, by design. We're going to have atomic consistency, that means inbuilt mechanisms for committing everything or nothing, like no partial configurations, no like strange things, right? It's going to be entirely atomic operations. And well, we're going to be able to do configurational and state-wise uh, um, changes in my devices, right? Whatever vendor that may be. And how does this work from a vendor perspective, right? Like, let's say, for example, I have my own networking company. I'm sell uh, selling these boxes, these routers, switches, load balancers, and I am implementing these models. Like, in a nutshell, this is how it is structured. It's just like a, a pretty, like, uh, I'm generalizing here for various vendors, but it's more or less how, what you will likely find with all these different vendors. So we have the very bottom, like in the southbound part of my device, I have all the features, not only the hardware ones, but also the logical ones. Like, my device can do BGP, my device can do ACLs, and all that sort of thing. Then moving a little bit northbound, I have the data model mapping, which is the configuration interface for all the things that are here down below in gray. And how we talk to this data model layer, most vendors will offer you two options. Like I logged in in my iOS XR, my iOS XR, we have two different sets of data models. One is the native one. This one is, for example, in this case, developed by Cisco, right? And it will map one-on-one -on -one to all the features that, I, that uh, my device can offer through the data model layer. And then the second one, as you can see here, is my open config implementation. 
That means that my vendor takes the open config models, which are publicly available in a repo, and thus the implementation brings them into the box. How does that work? We'll see that later, okay? It's not as easy <laughs> as it sounds. And then just to wrap it up, completely northbound interface, we have all the different protocols that we just discussed, and they're in the corner, the good, reliable CLI interface. Now, we have here two images uh, of the uh, data models that we have for ACLs. The one there to the left is what I just fetched from my device, from access control lists. It's huge. We have a lot of different parameters. We have a lot of different features in there. I want to compare it against the open config one, freshly extracted from the GitHub repo. You can see that the, the, the options are different, the names, even the amount of features that I have here. It doesn't map one-on-one. -on -one. There's a reason for it. And that's when we come to the nooks and crannies, because certainly the Open Config Initiative, it sounds too good to be true, but well, the reality, when we bring it into practice, it has some sort of a caveat, and I'll walk you through it in a moment. The benefits of working with open models is that we are into a faster innovation pace as these features, these, these models, they are based on contribution from individuals and also from all these big entities like service providers, the vendors themselves, and so on. So this means that these uh, models are evolving faster. It's a faster pace. They also uh, can, save, can help us to save uh, costs as we don't have to learn the specifics for all the vendors in my Brownfield network. I don't need to learn the specifics of my Arista or my Nokia layer if I already know OpenConfig. And if my scripts, if my orchestrators already use OpenConfig, ideally, I should be able to talk to everybody in the same way. However, because of the nature of the project, the OpenConfig models, they cater mostly for the, you know, the most widely used features across all the different vendors, which means that if my iOS XR box does something very specific, maybe a proprietary technology, a proprietary feature, certainly OpenConfig won't be able to cover for it. Therefore, for that specific part, I will have to use some other mechanisms for working with it, right? That's one of the main caveats. And moreover, when our vendors implement these open config models, sometimes because of the device, because it may not have the feature, all the features that open config is exposing out there, they will have to do some small adjustments, which means that still I cannot use the model as it comes from GitHub with my device. And that's where we have the concept of deviations. These deviations, these are mechanisms used by these vendors uh, so that they can do some small changes in order to be able to still use the open config models, but without compromising the models themselves and also the features in my device. And that this is doing this is small changes in the behavior of this um, of, of these open config models, right? These are files which are published inside of the box, inside of my Huawei, inside of my Juniper. And I can have a look at them and see which are these specific tweaks built on top of my open config implementation. There are a couple of these. For example, I can specify that I'm not supporting something, right? Let's say, for example, in this model that uh, open config is telling me, hey, you can set up the MTU of your interfaces. But then for some reason, my Arista device cannot, doesn't support MTU, right? For whatever reason that may be. Maybe it's not supported now, but like in a future release, it will be supported. But for now, I need to tell you that I'm not supporting MTU. So what I'm doing here is that I will publish this file, this .yang file, and I will have this deviation mark up there. And I will say, hey, this is specific path MTUs in interfaces is not supported, right? Then I have another type, which is the replace uh, deviation. In this one, this is a little bit more specific in the sense of maybe for my Huawei device, the MTU can only be integer, right? It can only be a number, 
And in the open config model that is in GitHub, it reads that it can be anything. It can be a string, for example. I want to be extra certain that, you know, by mistake, you're not going to be put there some uh, alphabetic characters, right? So what I do here is that I have this deviation and I'm saying, hey, it's not a string, it's not a float, it's not whatever you want, it's got to be a 32-bit integer, nothing more and nothing less, right? So this is a replace one. And finally, we have the add deviation. With this one, we are changing the behavior of any specific leaf or whatever that may be. In this case, for example, let's say that my Palo Alto device, the MTU has to be on, under a very specific range, right? If it's below that or on top of that, I'm going to get an error, right? Like an inconsistent state, whatever that may be. So I'm going to add this deviation and say, hey, please be careful. My MTU can only be in between this and this. If you do what, something different, I'm going to complain and I'm going to throw this error, right? How does this look in real life? How does this look in my devices? Let's find out. So I'm going to go back to my uh, notebook and spice things a little bit up with OpenConfig. I will uh, restore, okay, it's still up and running. This is perfect my netconf uh, session. I thought that it would have expired by now. So I'm going to get... Mm, hold on. <laughs> That's why I was telling you, I live by the demo or I, I die by the demo. Brilliant. Okay, now it's back on track. Awesome. Okay. I just downloaded the OpenConfig ACL a YANK file from my iOS XR device. I just downloaded it along with some uh, dependencies. And here, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to check the deviations. I have this file here, deviations file. Which are the deviations on my ACL? Let's find out. We can use PyYANK as well to do an analysis of how these deviations impact my implementation of ACL open config in my iOS XR router. I, I can use these commands. This is going to be saving the, the result in a, in a file. And then I'm just going to be using a diff lib library just to have like a diff uh, representation of these differences, right? And a very, very small, simple Python script. So as you can see here, we have quite a couple of differences, right? In between my implementation of ACL and then the deviations for this specific iOS XR version. And you can see here that we have a couple of minuses here, right? And uh, it's here some information, but here at the very bottom, we can see that in the state, the description uh, leaf is not supported. For some reason, my iOS XR device doesn't support having a description in the state when I use OpenConfig. There's another tool that we can use for analyzing all these uh, YANG files. Uh, it's an open source tool under the Apache license uh, made by Cisco. You can download it and explore it yourselves. It's called the Cisco YANG suite. So what I did here is I connected to the GitHub repository of OpenConfig and pulled all the YANG files from there. And here I have the ACL1 and I have the different configurations. And you can see here that it's super easy to explore. Like in the ACL sets in config, I have these three different leaves. I can set up the name, I can set up the type, and the description. But if I do the same with my iOS XR device, I plugged in into my iOS XR device, I downloaded all my YANG files, I'm checking the ACL one. You can see here, this leaf is grayed out. What does that mean? In my implementation of open config in this box, it is not supported, right? So you can do it uh, in both ways. The programmatic approach can help you to automate the analysis and to actually have documentation of it in order to take decisions of which model you are going to use based on your own needs, right? Of your use cases, whatever that may be. So now if we go back into our session, presentation here, sorry. Just to wrap it up with some tips and tricks, just to see, um, to do like some sort of conclusions. 
these deviations, as you saw, they can be easily automated, they can be easily analyzed and also versioned. That means that um, you can see if these open config models are the greatest fit for your use cases, and it can be part, for example, of your pipeline or whatever automated process you have already ongoing for your net DevOps approach. And you can follow this create once, use many approach, not based on your vendors specifically, not based on the CLI commands, but rather based on these deviations, right? right? Based instead of these deviations. And design your systems to be modular so that you can rely on these deviations instead of the vendors themselves. And then, last but not least, this is like a call to action or wrap up to ditch CLI-based scripting once and for all. Embrace the world of uh, data models based uh, network programmability and give it a go to open config, uh, the open config approach on very basic uh, use cases so you can see how it evolves little by little, right? And this is it from uh, my end. I'm leaving here some references and tooling. This is the Open Config Yang uh, repo. It, it is publicly available and very active, must I say. Some documentation for the paths, uh, the documents, the Yang suite tool for exploring the models and the repo. You can follow the QR code here. I'm just going to shift very briefly to that just to show you. You can find here in this repo of my own the uh, playbook and also the uh, slides. You can find it all here. So that would be it from my end. And now the microphone is all yours for any questions that you may have. Good. No doubts, no, no questions. All right. It is very widespread. Okay. Yeah, I worked. Uh, I've worked with like uh, uh, very like brownfield networks, and yeah, I've done open config implementations for at least Cisco for sure, Juniper, Arista, and Huawei. Yeah. Yeah. Come again. Uh, like which which was uh, the use case for this uh, implementation? Was that your question? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I can help you with the microphone because I'm really not uh, able to hear it from there. I don't know if uh, I can, let me pass it on to you. Oh, it's a it's a vendor. It's a name of a vendor. Oh, okay. Well, I I am not aware. I was not aware of that vendor. But uh, normally, if a vendor supports Open Config, the models will be available not only inside of the box, but also for sure the vendor will have a GitHub or a GitLab somewhere when they have those files available as well. So that's how you can check it. You can, inside of the box, for sure, you will, you will find them. Like if you do, as we saw before, the netconf connection in, like in the capabilities message, where you have like the list of the Yang files, there you will be able to see like openconfig this, dot Yang, openconfig that, dot Yang. But also most of the vendors, I'm not certain if all of them, but most of them, they publish all their data models on a repo, like on GitHub or GitLab. Whatever, yeah. At least the ones that I've worked with, they have their public repo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you guys know how it's supported or could it be supported something like OpenWRT where the same software runs on many different devices? Uh, you know OpenWRT, root of number? OpenWRT. WRT. Um, honestly, I'm not aware of this. Mm -hmm. It's more for home users, you know, uh, Linksys devices or different access points. Mm. Okay, so you're, you're asking about this uh, uh, framework that it's, is it mostly for IoT? <laughs> or network devices. Network devices. Mm. But it runs on many different devices, 
For OpenConfig, most likely it won't be supported as the features that it covers are more like enterprise networking oriented. Um, it's in the sense of routing protocols, uh, you know, like BGP, that, that sort of thing, access control lists, as we saw. But however, I would think that uh, model-based uh, control would be supported. There must be models somewhere. Like this is something widely adopted in the industry. Like the modeling approach with Yang and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I don't know if I answered your, your question. All right. Yes? So um, looking at this model-based configuration where I guess the idea is that you have your network devices that mm -hmm. come in from the outside yeah. and in a perfect world, this is the only way how you configure it all, right? Yes. But then I guess something happens, you need to quickly change something, so you jump in via the other interface. Yes, the, the CLI. Interface, <laughs> the CLI, whatever, you change them. Yeah. Um, now the, the values of this model change somehow and you try to reapply that, mm -hmm. which ideally still works, but then again, based on the deviations and all those things, that might also lead to certain pressures. Mm -hmm. Where do you see these things being addressed? Do you think like it would go in the direction where we block the other part completely and just say the only way is now via this netconfian or s mm -hmm. or whatever else? Or do you think there should be then an intermediate step where merging somehow happens and validation happens? Or how do you see, see this being mm -hmm. addressed? That's a very good question. I'm going to rephrase it for everybody. It's uh, like this network automation approach versus manually getting there and doing things, like where's the middle ground if it would crash, whatever. It really depends on your approach. Uh, ideally, we should automate everything. Sometimes that's not possible. And when it comes to the models, these are just models. These are just Yang files and the protocols for using them, they are just protocols. There is no intermediate layer of intelligence. That depends on your implementation. It can go from a very basic Python script, as we saw, to like a very robust orchestrator. And it would be then the responsibility of that layer, you know, the the script or the orchestrator to sort that out. I can tell you that some orchestrators out there like Ansible, for example, or NSO Crossworks, they are clever enough to identify out of band things and to do like this sort of reconciliation, right? But that is up to the automation engineer to sort out because these are critical things. In an ideal world, nobody should log in via CLI they should get a slap on the wrist, but the reality is very different, right? I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, you. <laughs> You're welcome. Any other question? No? Okay, well, I think that's it. Thanks a lot for your attention and enjoy the rest of the conference.